In the 14th century, fears of apocalypse gripped medieval Europe, for it seemed that the world was approaching the end times. Famine, plague, war, religious turmoil, and societal unrest tore much of Europe apart. It was the single longest period of societal stress since the 9th century that Europe had experienced, and as the century wore on, the problems compounded. Like all crises, the problems started off as small ones, localized fractures in a world which had been flourishing since the economic revolutions of the 11th and 12th centuries. Between 1000 and about 1250, medieval Europe had seen explosive population growth, an increase in wealth, and the renewal of cities. The population approximately tripled, and towns and cities were redesigned with markets at their centers instead of churches or cathedrals. A major part of what facilitated this explosion in population were new agricultural techniques, such as three-field rotation, all of which was made possible by a climatic optimum known as the medieval warm period. But, starting around 1250, the climate began to cool, and as the temperature dropped bit by bit, year after year, the growing season shortened and crops failed, until, in 1315, Due to a series of floods and cooler weather, crops failed completely, and bovine plague shredded populations of domesticated animals. Between 1315 and 1317, the price of grain nearly quadrupled, at least in the areas that actually had grain. As the price of grain skyrocketed, what money people actually had became dedicated to the procurement of food, which wiped out savings, depleted capital, and threw much of the interconnected medieval economy into chaos. Farming in the 14th century still followed practices developed in the 11th century. Three-field rotation, utilization of natural fertilizer, employment of the horse collar and the horseshoe, as well as wheeled plows all continued, but they had not really been improved upon, and no new techniques were introduced on any significant scale in the late 13th century, which compounded the problems encountered in the early 14th century. Estimates place the total affected area in a zone stretching from the Alps, to England, to Denmark, and then east to much of Poland and the Baltic countries. The Mediterranean also starved, and the coast was impacted by its own famine, miniature only in respect to the crisis in 1315, between 1311 and 1314, but there was less land mass impacted. Another way of looking at that, then, is that first the south and then the north suffered two prolonged bouts of food shortage. Altogether, estimates range between 30 to 40 million people affected by this famine, and skeletal evidence indicates that the general weakness of the population led to an uptick in disease. As if this were not bad enough, changes in Mediterranean geopolitics affected the economic situation as well, contributing to what would eventually become a crisis. In the eastern Mediterranean, the Roman Empire suffered a series of attacks and military setbacks that threw the state into a period of decline, and the rise of the Ottomans in Anatolia and the dominance of the Mamluks in Egypt created new societies which were focused more along ethnic ties and religious faith rather than trade, and with the exception of the Venetian and Catalonian merchants, economic ties to the eastern Mediterranean declined, and things became more localized. During the High Middle Ages, the European agricultural economy had gradually developed into monocultural zones, practicing what we today understand to be economic rationalism. Sicily, for example, developed into a major wheat producer, the majority of which the island exported. France has a well-deserved reputation for wines, and this is when that began, with vineyards in the south of the country taking off in the 12th and 13th centuries. Much like today's world, actually getting food in this period meant that food had to be shipped, which led to a booming economy. Hundreds of thousands of people were employed doing this, from farmers to cartwrights to ship captains, but the danger of the lucrative combination of economic specialization and interconnected trade which promoted a healthy economy is that if enough parts of that system became disrupted or were faced with problems it could not absorb in a rapid succession, everything fell apart and the combination of famine and political changes in the eastern Mediterranean altered that system, which meant that the effect of the famine often could not be mitigated. 
Due to the changes in climate, one of the most horrific effects was the curtailment of salt production, the chief preservative in medieval Europe, which eventually meant that the food that could be had could not be stored for very long. So what exactly was the problem with salt production? In medieval Europe, there were two principal means of acquiring salt. It could be mined, or it could be evaporated in salt ponds by evaporating or boiling seawater. In the year prior to the start of the Great Famine, and during much of it, much of Europe was hammered by unusually long rainstorms, which made it difficult to procure salt in a wet environment because the seawater had a more difficult time boiling off. By 1317, the famine had reached its peak, and nearly all the food supplies which had been stored, including the seed grain, had been devoured, and the farm animals had been slaughtered. In one priory in northern England, in 1315, there were 3,000 cattle. By the end of 1317, there were 800 left. The world, it seemed, quickly became overcrowded, and society in many places broke down. Not only were there food riots and revolts, but there were recorded abuses of the general population. Children were abandoned in forests, old people were denied food, and young people were denied food, since they stood a low chance of living anyway and reports of cannibalism became widespread. The effect of the famine stretched into the long term, probably the most serious effect of which was debt. Ordinarily, systems of debt and lines of credit are useful tools for advancing oneself or a community, but the breakdown of the agricultural economy and local manufacturing, the basis of medieval economic health, led to the impoverishment of farmers who could not earn enough to pay for their farms, and those poorer tenant farmers could not pay their rents. So landlords, ranging from the moderately wealthy farmer who rented out a portion of his field but still worked it, to those who collected rents and did some other form of work to survive, to those who collected rents to invest into other ventures, fell into debt, and became entangled in more debt when they took out loans to attempt to get by. The result, by the late 1320s, was a gigantic scheme where people took out loans to pay debts they had accrued while taking out other loans to pay other debts. In short, there were interconnected debt systems and no actual money to repay it, which led to the implosion of the Bardi, Peruzzi, and Riccardi banks, the last of which had loaned so much money to the English crown that the argument could be made that the bank essentially propped up the monarchy in England. As this happened, those with capital remaining began to invest in their own local communities, and they began to buy local government bonds, which enabled local governments, especially in Italy, to have influxes of capital which they used to increase local stability and power. The result of this was not only the beginnings of the polities which would ignite the Renaissance in northern Italy and eastern Spain, but the distinct rise of new families like the Medici of Florence, many of whom came to see the governance of their cities as their right in return for the bonds they had purchased, which made stability possible in the first place. In any case, the economic changes of the High Middle Ages led to a migration of peasants from the countryside to the cities, and, just as the enclosure movement forced farmers into the cities in the 18th century, disruptions to the agricultural economy in 14th century Europe saw even more people move to the cities in search of work and food. Initially, this was not a problem, but as populations swelled, cities became unable to adequately deal with the influx, and crime, and prostitution, and the rise of street gangs were the results. Eventually, disease broke out in many of these European cities, and the surviving documentation of those outbreaks strongly suggests tuberculosis. By 1322, food production levels had returned to normal. Or maybe a more accurate, although more morbid, way of understanding this is that enough people had died and the climate had stabilized enough that famine was no longer an immediate threat because there simply were not enough people around to actually starve. The horrific levels of death led to a rise in the belief in apocalypticism, with the famine and its associated problems being blamed on divine judgment and the influence of the devil. No matter where you were, no matter who you associated with, behind everything, Satan tempted. Faith in the Catholic Church was severely undermined, and in response, 
since Catholic prayers did not seem to be working, heresies began to spread. Things had become far more violent, and in the next 20 years, things would become more violent still, as war engulfed the land, and rats, carrying plague, emerged from the shadows to plunge Europe into a new circle of hell. <laughs>